Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning, wherever you are. Thanks again for joining us for uh, our October 16th. Uh, lucky for hopefully all of us edition of our Clarity in a Time of Crisis webinar series. My name's Chris Adams. I look after research and insights at uh, Miles Partnership. And um, we're delighted to be um, taking another fresh look at uh, the outlook for travel in the US and also jumping across the Atlantic for insights and practical lessons from uh, Europe. And this is part of our continuing series to bring um, examples, case studies and insights from leading research and data partners and destinations all over the world. Um, and we're delighted to be joined by a, uh, a three very familiar faces to you all. So let me introduce them. Uh, Amir Alon is president and CEO at Longwoods International, our wonderful partner in researching the impact of COVID-19 on travel uh, in the US. And um, Amir, are you still safely tucked away in um, Ohio? Safely tucked away, but happy to report that I've actually had a couple business trips in the past month. So. Life's getting better. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and Amir is going to be covering the latest insights from our fortnightly COVID-19 travel sentiment research with some fascinating insights um, around holiday travel. And we're also excited to be joined by two other very familiar friends and uh, uh, familiar faces from an early edition of our Clarity webinar series. So Niall Tracy is Director of Marketing at Falky Island, the Irish Tourism Development Authority. And um, Niall joined us in our very first edition of the Clarity in a Time of Crisis webinar series all the way back at, in late March. Uh, and he's going to be giving us an update from the Emerald Islands uh, and also sharing their perspective on the coming months. Um, so some great insights there. And uh, Laura Alto, CEO of Helsinki Marketing, made uh, quite a splash when she joined us, I think it was the fifth edition in early May. Uh, and she showca showcased their remarkable work around uh, virtual events, sustainability initiatives, uh, what they're doing around open, open data innovation. Um, and so she's gonna be sharing an update from Helsinki, Finland, and again, uh, both of them will join us to share insights from Europe. So I'll welcome them back in in a moment. Um, but just before I pass over to Amir, uh, we've been um, aggregating all of the research resources and other information in our Clarity in the Time of Crisis uh, portal. So please take a look at that. Um, and that will include the recording from today, the slides from today. Uh, and other resources that we're going to reference uh, during today. So access that. And uh, without further ado, let me pass over to Amir. And uh, uh, for the last uh, seven months, I think it is now, Amir, we've been um, supporting you in undertaking this research on the interest, behavior, and outlook for travel during COVID-19 of the American travelers. And uh, you've got an update for us on what we've seen over the last month or two, and also what are we likely to see as we uh, look upon the holiday season. So over to you, Amir. Thank you, Chris, and hello, everyone. Good to be back. And uh, I do, again, want to acknowledge our partners here and friends at Miles, because uh, thanks to their uh, partnership and support, uh, we've been able to keep this uh, study going throughout the year and uh, make it available at no charge to the entire industry. So uh, that really means a lot, I know, to so many people. So thank you so much. Uh, well, wave 22, whoever would have thunk it, huh? We're already in wave 22. I, I, I'm really looking forward to the day we can say this is the last wave of this study in a pandemic context and uh, there, but uh, this data was uh, just fresh out of the field. We released it this morning. Uh, we were in the field last week, last Wednesday and Thursday, uh, doing our usual uh, survey of a thousand traveling with the Americans and 18 years and older, and uh, uh, you know, just a, a good cross section of uh, representative sample of the U.S. in terms of American travelers. And let's just jump right into the data. Um, you know, we're going to see uh, kind of some stabilization. We're going to see a few silver linings, but. Uh, we're also going to see some uh, 
some holiday travel data and you're going to decide uh, whether I'm the Grinch or Santa Claus today. So let's see. 66% uh, of travelers planning to travel in the next six months are either have or in the process of changing their travel plans due to the coronavirus. Uh, how does that break out? About 49% indicated to us that they've reduced their travel plans in some form or fashion. Uh, about 40, almost 40% have uh, gone on an outright canceled uh, planned trip. About one third have changed from a flying trip to a driving trip. We know that's, if you've been following along, that's been the trend. And we all know that it's going to be the regional drive markets that kind of uh, recover first. And we've already seen a lot of great indicators of that as certain parts of the country have reopened. Uh, and of course, 17% uh, are changing their travel from international to domestic. It's kind of the residual uh, leftover trip, international trips that we planned. The best thing about doing this for several months, obviously, is that we've got the, the trend lines and you can see the roller coaster that we've been on and you felt it and now you can visualize it. But, uh, you know, with 66%, it basically is the lowest uh, um, uh, uh, percentage that we've seen since the very first week of the survey uh, back in March of, of travel planning to change our upcoming travel plan. So it's inching in the right direction. But again, until there's treatment, uh, viable treatment, uh, vaccine and so forth, we don't see that really uh, making any leaps and bounds back down uh, by any means. So again, the trend lines in terms of uh, canceling trips versus reducing trips. And you saw for the last couple of months as you've been following along, that uh, the re reducing travel plans was greatly outpacing the outright cancellation of plans. And then last wave, about two weeks ago, we saw this sudden blip up uh, uh, there. And thank God, we, we always say one data point does not make a trend. So, uh, so uh, it, it, uh, it, it kind of reversed itself here with this latest wave. And that's encouraging to see that, uh, again, overall, uh, people are just changing how their how the trips that they're planning, not, uh, not outright canceling. Uh, again, that shift to, to drive market destinations, whether they're short short trips or longer distance trips, uh, continues to happen. And of course, um, that changeover from international to domestic. And keep in mind, uh, you know, that's several billion dollars of visitor spending that Americans usually spend abroad every year. That's not happening right now. And so as, as those uh, Americans and, and tend to, who tend to be generally a little bit more affluent are actually spending, they're planning to spend domestically. So there's an opportunity for some market share capture um, if we play our cards right as destinations. As you know, if you've been following along, we always ask about three key factors that would impact the traveler's decision to travel in the next six months. Uh, uh, one is transportation, the other one's concern about the economy, and of course, the 500 pound gorilla in the room, as you can see there, is the fear of the pandemic. Transportation costs, you know, have been pretty negligible from the beginning, um, but that fear of coronavirus, uh, we've kind of plateaued with it, as you can see on the trend line here for the past couple months, uh, we've really been holding steady kind of in the upper 40s, just around 50% uh, level there, and uh, again, don't expect that to decrease precipitously uh, until there is any official announcements about vaccine, et cetera. And the economic concerns, that's been a constant right through the beginning. You can see it's almost a straight line if you, if you, if you were to plot it across uh, here through the course of the survey here. Uh, again, speaking up, you've heard me say it before that you know there's this big bent, pent up ball demand. It's not about um, uh, about if I can afford to travel, it's about how and when I'm going to travel and, and, and what risk am I willing to take to travel and so forth, as, as we're seeing. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not the pocketbook concern, and for a whole host of reasons. Uh, and then we always ask, are you going to be traveling in the next six months? And you can see uh, two thirds of the American traveling public is telling us, yes, we still see ourselves traveling in the next six months. Now, remember, this is all sentiment. Uh, you know, so this is this is getting sentiment and intent, uh, et cetera. It's not the actual what's what's transpired, and, and you know, events will dictate more what happens and doesn't happen. And in a couple of weeks, we actually will be giving a sneak peek as to some of the things we've actually observed uh, in, the, in the second quarter of this year in relation to travel. So stay tuned. There's a little teaser for you. Now, you, as you all know, we always ask a timely question every week, kind of our wild card question, as Chris alluded to earlier. Here's the holiday question uh, uh, there. So um, glass half full, glass half empty, you decide. But basically about half of American travelers are telling us at this moment they're not planning to take a trip this holiday season. Uh, for those who are, 
Obviously, about uh, the road trips are going to dominate. We've seen that pattern uh, time and time again. We see about 19% indicating to us that they'll be traveling by plane over the holiday season. Uh, in there, that's slightly you know higher volume perhaps than uh, than, than the uh, airlines and airports have seen uh, you know, in, in recent weeks, but uh, still not the uh, the booming overcrowded airport scenes uh, around Thanksgiving and Christmas that we used to seeing. And you can kind of see here the intent in terms of sentiment about traveling over the holidays, with uh, obviously the strongest elements being Thanksgiving and Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, uh, etc., followed by New Year's so, there. And if you've been following along the last three or four months, you've also seen us ask these questions of travelers, not just as travelers, but the residents in their own community and asking about their support for welcoming visitors back into their backyard and uh, feel their safe, how safe they feel traveling outside their own community, as well as how safe they feel dining and shopping locally. Well, this picture is still pretty divided. And let's take a look and break that down. There's some not so good news and there's some silver linings here. The not so good news, as you can see, is over the last couple of weeks, we've actually seen a slip back into support for uh, um, opening up community to, to visitors. Uh, a lot of that really can be attributed to the news cycle, right? Over the last two weeks, we've now seen over, uh, a little bit over 30 states, I believe, at the last count, uh, reporting uh, significant rises in new cases, and many of them hitting kind of new daily records for uh, new cases in the pandemic. That's obviously going to impact that uh, aspect of sentiment. Uh, and then uh, silver linings, we've really seen a good stabilization holding steady at about half the traveling public saying they feel safe traveling outside their community. Obviously, we want to get that greatly over 50% uh, there, but, uh, but hey, we'll take the half right now and, and stabilization is good. Uh, it's better than the volatility that we've seen earlier. And uh, as we've reported on the last couple of rounds here, um, you know, about half the traveling public now on its residents also feel uh, safe dining and shopping locally, which is a very good thing. We all know that is uh, the fundamental first step in that dipping the toe in the water with consumer confidence, traveler confidence to get people out and about moving. But they can go out to eat and shop and they can maybe take a day trip, maybe an overnight weekend getaway, and then so on and so forth. Uh, uh, people are managing the risk and you know incrementally in their ways that are personal and, and, and feel safe to them. So Chris, how about we talk about uh, what this all means? Very good. Thanks for that quick update. I just really wanted to highlight uh, Amir, something we asked about a month ago and it really picks up on the points you've been emphasizing around health and safety. So you can see here, we asked about protocols, guidelines, travel restrictions. And in fact, if you group all these up, 86% of American travelers expressed confusion, concern, uncertainty around the various guidelines, protocols, and restrictions um, in terms of travel. US Travel's um, been trying to tackle this as part of their uh, Let's Go There campaign. They've got a aggregation of travel information, but I really wanted to emphasize this because obviously we've got to make people feel safe. We've also got to give them certainty. And so the extent to which your destination can work collaboratively at a state, county, city level, even with other states, certainly with your industry and ensure that there's consistent, clear and standardized information and guidelines is going to be critically important in terms of reopening. And if you look around the world at various destinations that are uh, recovering more strongly, whether it's in Singapore or Taiwan, or even across the US or Canada, uh, a lot of outdoor orientated communities, they are ones that have often uh, got a very consistent, clear, uh, and across the industry messaging around health and safety. And in fact, uh, we're gonna hear from um, Niall shortly about what they're doing in Ireland at a nationwide level. So I think there's some great insights there. Um, okay, so, um, and just in terms of takeaways, I really just wanted to emphasize three key things. So one is this health and safety messaging, consistency, clarity, critically important. Uh, we're seeing from the data that a cautious, uh, uneven recovery is taking place. Um, there's potentially going to be some real challenges over the winter months as things like outdoor dining become um, a little bit more problematic uh, and, you know, a potential increase in case numbers, etc. 
Um, so we, we're going to really hunker down, I think, and support our industry, support um, more vulnerable businesses over the coming few months. The outlook for 2021 is brightening, and that's the good news, that certainly from sort of Q2, Q2, Q2 into Q3, uh, a vaccine and improved therapeutics look increasingly likely. And so hopefully that will become more clear and certain as we um, you know, approach the new year and into 2021. Uh, and certainly in terms of that recovery, we've got opportunities in terms of VFR, um, and drive markets, and it all often really is about the locals and building that support, that confidence from our local markets. Um, so all of these resources are available on both the Longwood site, uh, the Miles site, and on our COVID-19 portal. So please take advantage of that in terms of accessing the full research. Um, and Amir, thank you so much for joining us today. You'll come back at the end for some Q&A. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks, Amir. And thanks so much to Longwoods and the whole team there for all the wonderful work they put in on the research. Uh, just before we cross the Atlantic and jump into Ireland, Helsinki, and the sort of lessons from uh, um, their industries, I wanted to highlight the Funding Futures um, project. This is a major uh, project that was taken with Civitas Tourism Economics with tremendous uh, input and support from US Travel, uh, DMAC up in Canada, uh, Destination Analysts and other partners. And uh, it's really describing outlooks and opportunities for tourism funding for destinations. Uh, we've got two upcoming webinars. Um, so we'll be looking at dedicated funding, such as tourism recovery, uh, and improvement districts, tax increment uh, financing. So that's a deep dive into some of those topics on November 3rd. And then a really exciting webinar on November 10th, where we're actually gonna bring together the insights from a major parallel European study with the North American study. And I think actually Laura will be uh, referencing that. Um, she's on the board of European Cities Marketing, which is one of the key partners in that project. So um, just a poll before we ask uh, Niall and Laura to join us. So we asked this question a couple of months ago. We wanted you to provide your perspective on what you think the outlook is gonna be in terms of the level of travel expenditure in your specific destination. So um, looking ahead to the fall and winter, what level of travel expenditure do you expect relative to the same period last year? To answer that question, we'll have a look at the results and then we'll compare it to the same question or a similar question that we asked a couple of months ago. Uh, and then I'm going to be asking um, Laura and Niall for their perspective as well. Okay, I'll give you another few seconds here to answer the question and then we'll have a quick look at the results. Okay, let's close off the survey and have a look at what people thought. Okay, so we can see it's uh, neck and neck between um, a drop of uh, 25 to 50%, so about a quarter of people think that. Uh, another quarter, just over a quarter, 27% think uh, it's going to be a more substantial drop. And then uh, we've got um, a more confident 13% feeling it's only going to be a drop somewhere in the sort of 1 to 25%. And then 19% uh, feel somewhat more pessimistically. So let's have a look at the comparative results back in I think it was early August here that we asked this, a very similar question. And you can see there was a little bit more unanimity about uh, the outlook with just over a half expecting it was going to be down between 30% to 60%. So um, without further ado, let me bring in Niall and Laura. So wonderful you can rejoin us again, guys. So, um, before I ask you to share a couple of specific examples of programs and initiatives you're working on, 
uh, if you, you could perhaps um, give us a quick update on what's happened since we last connected with you over the summer. You know, how did, how did travel uh, in Ireland and Helsinki and Finland sort of progress over the summer? Uh, and what's the current situation? So, um, Niall, why don't you chime in first? Uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks very much. And as I said, it's great. It's great to be back. You know, it's mm. it's been a funny few months. Um, it's a cri it's a, it, to be honest, it's like a crisis that just keeps on giving. Just when you get a sense of some sort of well, we, we're in Ireland, we're calling it a roadmap. Some sort of sense of a, of how how both the the government, the country, the economy, tourism, how the plan might look like. Um, it seems to take another swift turn and a whole wrath of more changes come through. So Ireland, as your Chris said, so we, we'd welcome normally, like in 2019, we welcomed 9 million visitors from overseas. So even though we're a small island off, you know, off the, of the west coast of Europe, you know, uh, overseas tourism is huge, is, is huge here. And about overseas would be about two thirds of our tourism market. About a third is locals and two thirds is the overseas. But when we closed down in March, we literally just kind of closed like the vast majority of countries did. And then we reopened in July. And actually we opened in July to quite a level of positivity. In fact, the government announced also in parallel to tourism opening what they called a July stimulus, which was a whole new stimulus package to support lots of industries, including tourism. And with the idea being that from July, we're now back on the road again to, to kind of a a, a new normal, as you might say. But we only really had July and August at the tourism. And then come September, with the significant increase, not, not only in Ireland, but across the world in cases, we've now kind of come back into different forms of lockdown. And so Ireland recently announced a, a what we're calling a five step, as I said, roadmap. And you go from, so level five is a full lockdown, like March. And level one is kind of, is, much more a normal economy, though there are still some restrictions, but much more normal. So we're now in Ireland at level three, which has us basically confined to just our own county area. So it's kind of not even, not even stay within the country, but even stay mm. within our kind of local county area. So that's obviously devastated what tourism businesses had opened and opened in good faith, you know, and had a good July and August, the ones that did open. And, um, but now having to, so many of them have had to close again. So it is a, a huge amount of kind of uncertainty now, I would say, not just in tourism, but also even with consumers as regards, you know, what's next as regards the crisis and the impact it's going to have in our lives. Yeah, absolutely. I think it highlights how this is very much a marathon, not a sprint. And um, you're dealing with these uh, fresh challenges as part and parcel of what uh, every destination is dealt with. So, uh, Laura, do you want to give us an update from Helsinki and Finland? What happened uh, since you did this in early May? And uh, how did summer and then autumn sort of travel? And what's the current situation in Helsinki? Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. I'm so ha happy to be back here and sharing our experiences. And uh, as you said, definitely, it's, it's a marathon or, I don't know, two marathons or three in a row. <laughs> Um, well, definitely we, ha we didn't really foresee in, in, in May when I was, last time I was here, that was coming for the summer. Of course, we were hoping for the best. Um, it didn't turn out as, as well as we thought. Uh, Helsinki is very dependent on international, uh, travel. Um, and, uh, and even so the, the numbers of COVID cases in, in Finland have, have not been that high, but we've had a very strict, very, actually very, very much of restrictions for, for foreign visitors coming here. So it's been very hard to get in here. Um, and uh, the, as I'm going to talk about in my presentation a bit, so uh, we did a, a major campaign in, in Finland, but actually the, what, what was found out that the, uh, the Finns don't want to come to a big city. It's the same thing that happened all over Europe. So people are avoiding cities in this crisis. And the second thing, which is quite um, specific for, for Helsinki, that is uh, about half of our um, tourism industry is meetings industry. And this crisis is hitting very bad to, to meetings industry, as we all know. So this would have been a fantastic 
conference year for Helsinki, but it's not. So, um, um, yeah, a, a difficult year as we all had, but, um, and especially because you, the, you don't see that far away, kind of, um, you don't, it's really, really, really difficult to, um, uh, to try to understand what happens next. I, I try to uh, talk a bit more about that, how we see the future. Yeah, very good. And we'll come back as you uh, say to a couple of those themes. So what I'd like to do is ask each of you to um, share two or three programs that you thought were particularly impactful. So we wanted to offer the audience, you know, some practical examples of things that uh, worked why they worked and perhaps some lessons on what you might do a little bit differently. So, uh, Niall, why don't you kick it off by sharing a couple of the programs you worked on in Ireland over recent months? Sure, Chris. So, um, just to, I thought I might start off with one around um, our marketing message. So, what, as I mentioned at start, about a third of our tourism is based is domestic, so people kind of stay locally. And so we would have had, which many of you would have, you know, our campaign was all about kind of things like discovery and it was all about, you know, kind of like, you know, being able to kind of uh, change of scene and go out and enjoy the countryside, etc. And when we realized that, you know, when the market was going to reopen in July, that we needed to really take advantage of that domestic supposed pent up demand, we actually, rather than putting more money behind our existing campaign, we actually created a new campaign called Ireland Make a Break for It. And there's actually, the insight behind it was this idea that you know, people didn't really care as much as they normally would about beautiful scenery and kind of like new experiences. They just wanted to get out of their house. They just wanted to get out of their neighborhood because like many parts of the world, we were restricted to a certain radius with, from our house that we were allowed to travel in or go for exercise in. So this sense of actually, there was just this desire just to get out. And so we created um, Ireland Make a Break for it. it. We did a TV ad and video, and I've actually included a link to that um, that is available here through, through, through this, uh, in this webinar. And then we did a kind of a, a make a break for, you know, Galway, a make a break for Kerry, and we showed then different destinations within it. And actually that proved, it was interesting, that proved very successful in that it tapped into how people were feeling. And I suppose that was a big learning from this was, the, the, what would be normal year on year type of marketing campaign that we would have done for our destination. Actually people's head were in a, di are in a different place and actually tapping into that different place actually made, meant that we were much more of the solution. We understood their problem. So it's where they are and how they're living and we could provide the solution, which is get away. The other interesting thing just about this campaign was that, you know, Many people, including kind of newspapers and media and even the government, will be talking we're talking about this pent up demand from domestic. That as soon as you know people are allowed to travel, they may not go overseas, but they'll be down on the beaches and into the midlands, into the greenways and the walkways, etc. But actually that didn't really happen. There was a big a big the way for as many people who went on a domestic break that wouldn't normally, there was about the same amount who didn't travel. And, from, and it's interesting when we looked at the reasons, it goes back to what Amir was talking as, at the start about safety. They were still, you know, I want to get away, have no doubt about that, but actually is it safe to go away? And not just if I'm an older person or, you know, but also maybe if I'm younger and I've got an elder family or parents close by, you know, everyone just thinking through whether it was safe to travel. But the first learning was understand where people's heads are at. And I think it's going to be interesting where we are now and we get into the new year and more markets like, like ourselves and, and, and other markets around this call, as your market reopens, whether it be for domestic or for overseas, the, pre, the campaign you have always traditionally run, the new version of it that you plan to run, it's worth checking that in again and just seeing are people's head in a different place because tapping into that actually could make a big difference to your destination um, and that, that new psyche that people will have. And then the the second uh, big one I'll just share with you is actually around safety. And Ireland, like, to be honest, like many markets, because we looked around the world when we were doing our, our, um, our, our look at our safety messaging, and we found lots of countries doing this. But we looked, but we came up with our, what we call a safety charter. And it was a charter because it's not a guarantee. 
you know, so we were careful about our language. But what we did was, because um, we're the tourism authority, we created guidelines for lots of different types of tourism businesses. Everything from a bed and breakfast to a hotel, an attraction, to an activity provider who's doing those cycle tours. And actually, and again, there's a link on this webinar to all of the guidelines for all those different subsectors. And then what we did was we went to industry and said, if you'll sign up to, to, kind of, to, to adhere to these guidelines, then we'll let you use this safety charter logo to say that you know, your safety charter approved. And so we were able to get industry kind of using a single piece of branding to kind of to, as a reassurance message for consumers. And then what we did then is we then did a consumer campaign locally here in Ireland, explaining the logo and, and using it to re say, when you see this as a consumer, be reassured that the business is doing all, is, a, is, is adhering to all the guidelines and doing all the right things. What we can't guarantee is it is safe, of course, you know, because as we've seen over the last number of weeks and months, you know, this, this virus can get into the nooks and crannies of any business. But what it does do is that this, at least we're saying they're doing all the right things. And so you can be as reassured as much as you can. I think the big learning from this was twofold. One was the importance of actually having a set of guidelines that the industry could, could sign up to and connecting ourselves as in a consumer message with the industry so that there's a consistency of message and a consistency of reassurance for consumers because they're actually looking for this reassurance. I think the second one, which is, which, to be honest, Chris, we're, we're, still trying to, we're still working through is, you know, our hope was that this would be a relatively short run campaign that you know, once, once it was established, once those guidelines established, once people recognize the mark, then that would, then that, you know, that would then just become something they would look out for. But as we've seen with the huge numbers of increase across the world and in Ireland included, actually this safety message and how we evolve it to continue to reassure consumers that it's, that it's safe to travel, it's safe to go to different parts of the country, it's, it's, great, it's safe to stay in different types of accommodation, that actually we're going to have to continue to kind of review this and update it and continue to find ways of reassuring consumers. Because the sense is, is that that need for safety and reassurance is going to be with us well into 2021. And um, so getting everybody involved was key, but then actually how we evolve it now to, to, to continue to reassure is going to be, it's going to be a word, but there are big challenges that we're going to go after next year. So um, how many businesses, uh, Niall, did you, were you able to get signed up to the charter? Was it a significant proportion of the industry? It was, yeah, no, so it, 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 luckily enough, um, so we, we've had about, uh, about 4,000 actually signed up, but it, it, you know, when you look at the scale of the ones that have signed up and are participating, I'd say we're at about 70%, 60 to 65, 70% of the industry. Uh, a big one was things like the accommodation providers uh, and hotels in particular, they loved this because lots of the hotels, even some of the hotel groups, you know, were trying to come up with their own kind of logos and branding and reassurance message. Mm. So the fact that they could sign up something that was kind of government approved, so you had that kind of credibility behind it, um, actually kind of took away a lot of the workload from them and knowing that we were then going to, that we were then going to um, promote it. So the no need to businesses use it in their own promotional campaigns. So if you see on the website and if they're doing press ads, et cetera, but if you were to go to the business, you'll see the logo in lots of different kind of touch points from the entrance into your bedroom, et cetera. So you have that constant reassurance message even while you're at the, actually at the accommodation or at the attraction. Yeah. And just one additional question before we pass over to Laura. Um, so what, what, were the, what was the outreach that you did to industry? How did you get that 70% of businesses involved? Obviously. Mm -hmm involved um, virtual and online communication, but did you have other ways to engage with business and support them? We did. So the, to, to get this through, actually, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, working with the industry sounds like a very easy thing to do. And all of us know, and this, this you know, on these calls, how difficult it can be. But we did go with the trade bodies, the organizations that represented bed and breakfast or represented hotels, represented attractions. And um, we got them to work with us on designing it, the, the, the guidelines, because, you know, I suppose the government, in, all governments have given broad, very broad guidelines of what needs to be done within society and within the economy and within the tourism sector, but they're very broad. 
So what they agreed to do was work with us to bring it down to the very detail level, right down to in hotel, you, uh, you don't have pen, they don't have pens available. And if they give a consumer a pen, they don't, have, they don't take it back. You know, so there's no pens sitting on a reception desk to sign in. Um, because so right down to lots of to minutia of detail in the guidelines. But I think getting there, getting the, the different trade organizations involved helped us significantly just kind of get a bit of momentum behind this and get, and get us to the industry then to, to support it. Very good. Um, so Niall, stand by. Um, so Laura, um, can you share with us two or three programs that Helsinki City Marketing undertook and you know, what were the sort of lessons and takeaways you can share? Yes, thank you. And once more, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, and a good evening from Helsinki is what, 10.35 uh, p.m. <laughs> in Helsinki. It's dark outside. <laughs> Uh, it's, um, and I guess we are from all over the world here. So I will talk about three topics. Uh, first, I will talk about Helsinki. Then I will talk about a, a couple of things we've done here. And just to give you an overview of uh, what the situation is in, in, in Helsinki in the time of COVID crisis. Um, I will take a look at Lapland in the north of Finland, uh, which is quite a specific area for uh, from the tourism perspective, um, I talked with my colleague there and I have a few insights from there. Uh, and then I'll talk about the situation in the European cities and uh, a financial survey we, we, we did um, quite recently. But let's take first look at Helsinki. So uh, this is the very city center of Helsinki with a beautiful swimming pool <laughs> and uh, the city hall at the, uh, at the back of the picture. Um, uh, Helsinki is the northernmost capital of Europe, uh, and uh, we, we, Finland is one of the uh, Nordic, uh, Nordic countries, uh, and in recent years we've seen uh, quite tremendous growth in tourism numbers in, in, in Helsinki. Uh, before that, we were um, a bit overshadowed by other Nordic capitals, let's put it that way, by, by Stockholm and Copenhagen, but, but we were coming, uh, com coming, coming from behind them. Uh, last year, we had about 4.5 million uh, overnight stays in, in Helsinki with an occupancy rate of 75%, which is, uh, which is very high. Um, and um, but, uh, and uh, even though, like I said, we've been a bit overshadowed by Nordic neighbors, we've had a lot of coverage lately, especially for digital innovation and for sustainability. Uh, and uh, the tourism market is or, or was, <laughs> Uh, quite balanced, quite well balanced. Uh, uh, last year, last last year, and actually the, the years before that was like half half uh, business and, and leisure, um, and we had six to seven quite like equally big markets. Um, uh, visitors coming from um, uh, from Russia, Sweden, Germany, UK, US, China, Japan, uh, and uh, the Finnish air carrier Finnair uh, has has had a strategy or it still has a strategy strongly to focus on Asian market. So it's, it's the fastest way from Europe to Europe to Asia. Um, and we've uh, greatly benefited from their focus to, to the Asian market. But now today, everything is, is, is quite different. Uh, the occupancy rate in hotels is now around 20% uh, in the, during the summer months, uh, it was um, around 30 uh, in the weekends, maybe, 40%. Um, uh, and uh, so the industry is in big trouble as, as, as everywhere. Um, and like I said previously, Helsinki uh, is hit more than other destinations in Finland uh, because we are so dependent on international tourism. Uh, around 50, 55% of all overnight stays were, um, uh, are foreign visitors. Uh, last year, and uh, uh, like I said, half of the business is, 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 is business, business visitors. And uh, we did a lot, quite a major domestic campaign uh, with uh, basically very, very little results. So, uh, and, and there's a kind of like quite negative approach to the capital at the moment in the sense that the, the, the whole COVID crisis started from here. Now it's all over the country, but it started from here. So in the, in the springtime and all, still in the summertime, it was 
very much kind of like not going there. Um, but um, how do we see then the future and how, we, how do we look, look at the future? And even though it's quite, it is quite dark here at the moment, <laughs> well, I mean, literally dark and then, and then the industry-wise dark as well. Um, I personally think that you should never waste a good crisis <laughs> um, in terms of uh, uh, trying to, to reinvent the industry and, and reinvent the business log logic and understand that where, where the world is going to. So um, we have, um, I'd like to share three findings, key findings for us at the moment, how, how we look at the crisis now. Uh, first, uh, I think personally, and, and based on the uh, uh, foresight work we've done and, 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 the, and, the, and a lot of the surveys we've, we've been going through is that I, I think that customer behavior will change tremendously after the crisis. Um, when we start traveling again, we need a stronger why we travel. Uh, and uh, it, it needs to be in line, in line with the values we have. Uh, and, and for destinations, I think this means that um, we need to become a lot better communicating the, the purpose of our city and the values that we carry along. Uh, uh, because we don't want to go places that are meaningless for us. Um, and even if you travel less, we might end up spending more. Uh, so I, I believe there's a strong, there's a growing need for personalized services uh, and unique experiences and, you know, access to um, activities that are meaningful for us. Um, and, and, and this also means that we need to, to be better and to identify the targets and, and targets based on values and not on demographics. Uh, so there's a is a, a there's a lot of learning for the for the DMOs and and, and for our partners. And secondly, um, I noticed that this is part of the the questions that we got from uh, um, uh, beforehand. I think sustainability uh, the importance of sustainability increases, not decreases, uh, and and this is a link to my previous point. So because uh, we look at sustainability even from an even broader perspective, not only ecological and, and economical, but also the social sustainability. So we want to be sure of what kind of impact you make on the community, on the destination we travel to. Um, and uh, uh, this has a lot to do with the safety, the feeling of safety, as, as Niall so beautifully, um, it's a beautiful example of what you've done in, in Ireland. But also the, uh, the the space around us the, and, and the impact we make on the, the society we travel to. Then, thirdly, um, uh, I think this digital disruption hits the visitor economy uh, hard now, and and we need completely new business models and completely new skills in in, in DMOs. Uh, and I, I think, therefore, I believe that all in this industry should now invest in digital innovation and, 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 and kind of like have the capabilities to, 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 uh, to make the future. Uh, and this is, uh, this is an example that I want to briefly share with you. Uh, this is a, uh, a WDBE conference that took place in Helsinki uh, just about two weeks ago. Uh, and um, my question here is that what is the future of event industry and business meetings? And, uh, and like here again, COVID has forced us to rethink many aspects of business and government and, uh, and urban life. Uh, so this was a conference that took place completely virtually. Um, it was a World Summit of Digital Build Environment Conference. Uh, and uh, it took place in an illusion city combining Helsinki and Tallinn. So Tallinn is the capital of Estonia. So all of this, what is created here is not neither Helsinki, neither Tallinn, but it's a combination of these two, two cities. And it was a fully virtual event um, that was created by Helsinki-based VR studio Zoan, the same company that we worked on for the uh, May Day concert that I was talking, talking here earlier. Um, and this event brought together gaming technology and business conference uh, with, a, with the help of gaming company Epic Games and Unreal Engine. 
which is normally, normally they have nothing to do with the meetings industry. I mean, there's this gaming company that, uh, that provides, uh, you know, most advanced real time 3D tools. Uh, but this conference was pixel streaming technology and Unreal Engine. They were used to create a unique and world, real world, real time experience in virtual reality. Um, and I mean, this was an experiment. <laughs> it was a, a conference for 522 attendees from 27 countries. But I think I wanted to share this with you because I think it's important to try out something, try out something that you've never done before. Uh, and, and in this way, you don't only react to the, to the changes in the world, but you actually make the future and you make the innovation yourself. And I think for us DMOs, it's really important to, to kind of like, uh, gently force our people to do things that they normally don't do and, 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 and you know, try to um, uh, work with businesses like this gaming company, I mean, major American gaming company, <laughs> Epic Games, that they, they kind of like do things what is not, uh, not in their kind of like uh, normal day-to-day -day work. And then the third thing I wanted to point out here is uh, Lapland. Um, it doesn't look quite like that at the moment, but it will uh, quite soon. The first snow comes there. Um, uh, it's the northernmost part of the country, a magical Arctic region known for, you know, reindeers and snow and uh, all of these um, northern lights and outdoor activities. And of course, the Santa Claus lives there. Uh, and uh, about 60 to 70 percent of their income uh, comes from the winter season, so it's a winter destination, um, and especially Christmas is uh, is one of the backbones in, in in Lapland tourism. And it does not look very good for for this year. Um, one specific feature in Lapland tourism is that they have a lot of charter flights coming directly to Lapland, especially from UK and from other European uh, European countries. And now that the Finnish national government has been very strict about the travel restrictions, the tour operators are getting very nervous uh, and they're looking at other markets nearby, meaning Swedish, Lapland and, and Norwegian, um, north of Norway. Um, and uh, if we, uh, at the moment, it's, it's actually very, very difficult to, to arrive to, to, to Finland at the moment. The incoming tourists are divided into three categories. Uh, green, uh, red, and gray, uh, and there are only a few so-called green countries in the in the world: um, New Zealand and Australia and Japan and and South Korea and so on, uh, where you don't need um, quarantine coming from those countries. And then most of the countries are either red or gray. Uh, for instance, all European countries are are red. Uh, U.S. is gray, uh, and uh, Canada is is red. So you need uh, um, you need uh, 14 days quarantine. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, if you think of the tourism in Lapland, which is quite often that people come there for three to five days. Uh, uh, so it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for the tour operators and it doesn't make sense for the, for the people um, wanting to come there. So, uh, so it's, um, it doesn't, doesn't look very, uh, very bright for, for Lapland either. Now, Let's talk uh, a bit about the European cities marketing. I'm, I'm really happy to be part of the, the board of the European cities marketing. It's a network organization, a membership of organization of European DMOs. Uh, and um, uh, we, um, uh, we conducted a survey to better understand the financial situation of, of our members. And I will say, share some insights from it. Uh, um, uh, the, the immediate observation is that um, very few DMOs are left unaffected by the crisis. Uh, so almost 75% uh, of the 60, 67 DMOs in the survey had their 2020 budgets reducted, or almost, almost a third of these have seen severe reductions of more than 50%. Um, and uh, overall, uh, many DMOs have, have to rebuild their funding structure. I think it's the same case all, all, all over the world uh, in the coming years. And there's a strong need for more resi resilient funding structures for both DMOs and for, for destinations. 
Um, and in general, the budgets are decreasing in Europe. So uh, in uh, 2016, the budget was averagely, uh, in an average, 8.3 million. And in 2020, it's 5.9 million uh, euros. And um, only one out of four DMOs are left unchallenged by the crisis with either unchanged budgets or, or, or in improved budgets. And then um, uh, a quarter of DMOs are experiencing reduced commercial incomes uh, and 20% are um, seeing re reductions from private industry uh, or membership fees and 14% from reduced campaigns, campaign contributions. So in total, 71% of the DMOs are ex expected to have reduced budgets in 2021 regardless the recovery funds that might come. Um, and um, about a third of the DMOs expect to get part of recovery funding uh, from their city, uh, from uh, either kind of like recovery booster funds from the member state governments or contributions, uh, small part contributions from the industry partners. So this was a short overview from the financial survey. So uh, a lot of a uh, lot of difficulties within um, within the most European DMOs as well. Thank you, Laura. And uh, just on that final point you made, uh, just a reminder about the transatlantic webinar. So we actually coordinated quite closely with uh, Group Now, um, Peter and Sina. Everybody. We'll uh, hopefully remember Sina Yersted, who um, was part of the team working with ECM on this study. So we actually aligned um, the Funding Futures American study, and we're going to be hosting this transatlantic webinar you see there on November the 10th with DMO leaders from both Europe and North America identifying the sort of critical takeaways around future funding options and the priorities. So. Um, please uh, visit that web address to both access all the other resources and um, register for that webinar. And you'll also be able to access a summary of the combined research and study that Laura's outlined. So um, we're gonna jump into the question sections now, and we've got a couple of areas. Welcome back, Amir. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to pick up on the of meetings and events. So obviously the return or recovery of meetings and events very uncertain until we have a much safer uh, health uh, environment. But just I'm wondering um, how, how do you see meetings and events changing in the future once we're back to normal? Will this period of virtual events, etc., cetera, really re help reshape uh, meetings and events in some fundamental way. So, uh, Laura, did you have any perspective on that quickly? Well, I think, I mean, of course, um, I believe that conferences will come back. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a need for people meeting and sharing and, and you know, face-to-face -face, uh, coming together around uh, certain topics. But there might be... Uh, what might change even more is this kind of like um, business travel for one meeting or, or kind of like this, this meeting that has not a specific agenda. So uh, like I said, that because we need a stronger why for all kinds of travel in the future, that why we need to go to certain places. Uh, this uh, going for, from Helsinki to London for one, one occasion might uh, might might um, might not happen in the future. So, uh, Niall, do you have a perspective in terms of how how is Ireland seeing the return of um, events, which has been an important part of your international marketing strategy? It has, Chris, and and, actually, and and fortunately, we've been like Helsinki, very successful in attracting big events, global events, and 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 meetings and conferences. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I suppose two thoughts really. One is I, I share Laura's view. I think the, the role of a conference um, and even an event, it's it's actually it's, they're often a shared experience. It isn't about 
you know, it's not about the information that's communicated, like, you know, but it's actually the people you meet, the informal conversations, the, you know, the, that, the networking opportunity. And, and I think technology is always going to be very poor at that. But like, as Laura said, I think the, you know, the, the normal day in, day out meetings and travel that keep a lot of our hotels in a lot of our cities kind of busy Monday to Friday every week, that I think is definitely in trouble because, you know, because ev everyone's got used to these kind of Zoom calls. It means that we can, you know, so myself, you and me, Chris, we can have a good and um, detailed and a warm conversation now to, you know, using technology and feel comfortable with it far more than we would have felt comfortable six months ago. But uh, what, one, one thought about this one for you is that um, what we do here in Ireland, like I'm sure many DMOs, is that we actually run our own events for the tourism sector as a way for them to meet kind of international uh, tour operators, that they can present their, their accommodation, their experience, their package to try and be on kind of the uh, on group packages. And we had our, our first virtual kind of a trade event where we brought international buyers online with our, with our domestic businesses, um, which we normally do on a, obviously the face-to-face, -face, but, but we did it for the virtual time this year. And, 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 and what struck me afterwards was that actually, it, first of all, it did work better than we expected, but where it worked really well was where people already had a relationship with the people they were talking to. Mm -hmm. So I suppose as we're all looking at not only attractive meetings, but also looking at how we can actually use events to kind of help our tourism business on the ground be, and meet and engage and sell into tour operators for 2021 and 2022. One thing I think we can do is help them understand how to virtually sell themselves in the absence of a face-to-face -face meeting. And a lot of that is take out that old Rolodex, your old kind of file of facts, your, your contact list on your phone. And if you've met somebody before at a conference, at a meeting, whether it was last year or three years ago, it'll be much easier to sell to them, to, to present that business, to, to try and get into that tour operator's package than to a cold call to a new tour operator that you haven't met before. Because you know yourself, like when you meet somebody face to face, there's, there's a warmth, there's, there's an empathy, there's a connection that technology would always struggle with. So as we're looking into the future to drive more meetings and events, I think in the short term, we, there is an opportunity for us to encourage and help our local tourism businesses use their personal contacts, use their existing business contacts in order to, to try and get to, or to sell their wares into uh, tour operators um, and to set themselves into the market that way. Yes, yeah. But uh, virtual, there's no substitute for having a Guinness, mate, in uh, <laughs> the pubs you've got in Ireland. So uh, I look forward to that. Uh, Amir, do you have any uh, perspective on business travel or meetings of, and events in terms of what you're seeing in the recovery? Yeah, well, you know, here in the U.S., uh, there's a small amount of business travel that's beginning to happen again. Uh, most larger corporations and corporate travel managers are holding off on sending their team members of uh, 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 traveling for business, uh, if at all possible, um, into early next year. Uh, it's, it, 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 and we hear more second quarter than anything else uh, right now. Um, it, it's more of a question of liability. They really just don't want to have liability of God forbid one of their employees get yeah. seriously ill uh, and so forth. So it, it, it is going to be a slower you know, uh, recovery I think than people, people expected from that perspective. Uh, I think uh, you know, uh, to, to Laura's point, um, you know, there is going to be a new kind of reclassification of what's essential business travel uh, uh, and, and, and uh, um, rethinking, you know, especially with, with, with online, you know, with, with these virtual meetings and the ability to be, be hybrid, um, you know, are you going to see uh, smaller delegations in person where support team members and so forth uh, uh, are, are attending the same event, you know, virtually uh, so forth, so, so I think that's going to happen as well. Uh, but yeah, business travel is is, is going to uh, don't look for anything significant before uh, second quarter of next year. Very good, uh, and I'm conscious we're close to the top of the hour. Um, now we have got some additional resources. Um, both Niall and Laura uh, will be adding those to our uh, COVID nineteen clarity in a time of crisis website, and that will include some resources, Niall, that you shared around monitoring and reporting and measuring um, the views of the community 
terms of reopening. So we don't have time to dive into that now, but there's some great resources there in terms of what um, Ireland's been doing to understand what people are thinking as we reopen tourism and ensuring locals feel comfortable uh, welcoming visitors back. So uh, let me thank uh, Niall and Laura. Thank you so much for joining us again and sharing your perspective and insights. We look forward to staying in touch with you and hearing uh, how things are going. All the very best. Uh, and Amir and, and the team at Longwoods, thank you again for your partnership and for what you have been sharing. So, uh, but most importantly, thank you to all of you for joining us today. Be safe, uh, be well, uh, and we look forward to connecting soon. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.